What's up everybody? Today I'm here to talk about the books that I read this month in March, and I don't really have many books here today to talk about. I fell into a little bit of like mild burnout this month where I just wasn't really in the mood to read a whole lot. I still did reading throughout the month, just not quite as much as I normally do. So yeah, there's only a few books here, like probably half of what I normally read per month on average, uh, with six books in total here. And let's just get right into it. So the very first book that I, well, not read, but the first book I started this month is Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos by H.P. Lovecraft and others. This is an anthology collection of Cthulhu Mythos stories. And these stories range uh, from stories that were published all the way back in the 30s, published in like the Weird Tales magazines, um, with some more recent stories in here that I think are as recent as like the 70s and 80s. Um, and the two H.P. Lovecraft stories you have in this collection are The Call of Cthulhu and The Haunter of the Dark. And then the rest of the stories in this book are by various other authors contributing to the Cthulhu mythos with their own ideas. And for the most part, I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was pretty good. The stories in here that were my favorites, aside from H.P. Lovecraft's own stories, of course, were Robert Block's stories. Those were also the ones I was most excited to read, and I was... Happy that they were as good as I was hoping they would be. Um, <laughs> so the ones, main ones I'm referring to um, by Robert Block are, actually I have to look at the names because I already forgot. I believe The Shadow from the Steeple is one of them. Yes, so The Shambler from the Stars and The Shadow from the Steeple by Robert Block. And these two stories are basically like a prequel and a sequel to one of Lovecraft's stories, The Haunter of the Dark. It's kind of like a little mini trilogy of short stories, kind of. Uh, so Robert Block, way back in, I don't know when the story first came out, it'll probably take me too long to try to find it in here, but uh, back in like the 30s sometime, uh, Robert Block wrote a story called The Shambler from the Stars, and he dedicated it to H.P. Lovecraft. And this is a very short story. It was only like barely even 10 pages, I think, maybe not even, maybe it was like eight or nine pages long. And it's a, basically about this guy that obtains this, like, forbidden evil text um, along the lines of the Necronomicon. It's not the Necronomicon in the story, but something similar to that, where there's these evil symbols and this, like, foreign, like, language on it. I think it's, like, Latin or Greek text or something like that in this book. And he seeks someone out to, like, translate this text for him. To He wants to know what's in this book and what it says. And there's one person that he knows that can translate it and that will read it. And he goes to this person. And this person is kind of like the character of H.P. Lovecraft himself almost. There's a lot of, kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but there's a lot of like meta elements to not just this story, but a lot of stories in this collection. A lot of the stories in here refer to H.P. Lovecraft himself, even though they're fiction, and talk about... Lovecraft's own work as if it were potentially fact. Um, so yeah, that's kind of interesting. There's a lot of like meta stuff going on in here. Uh, but back to the Shambler from the Star story. They basically, he basically takes this book to this character and they read from this text. He At first he doesn't want to. He tells them it's evil. This book is, you know, no, nothing good is going to come out of this. Um, but of course, for the plot, they end up reading the book anyway. And from there, something really terrible happens. And I love this story. It was very entertaining. Even though it was very short, it doesn't really have a ton of story to it. It's basically these guys reading from this evil, forbidden book. And then something really bad occurring. And what I really liked about this story is it reminds me some like something straight out of the Evil Dead movies. Uh, now I know where the Evil Dead movies got their inspiration from. <laughs> from these old Lovecraft and Robert Block stories. Uh, when they read this book... Something crazy happens, uh, the windows and doors burst open with this wind rushing through and these evil spirits, like, yeah, doing crazy stuff. I don't want to spoil it. It's a very short story, but it was very, very good story. Uh, surprisingly violent and bloody, too. Lovecraft is not an author that usually uh, uses, like, violence and gore a whole lot in his stories. Um, and even, like, these older stories like this, they're typically not real graphic. They usually aim for a more like atmospheric or subtle kind of horror and typically like leave more up to the imagination. Uh, but this story was pretty violent at the end. It 
it surprised me. <laughs> so yeah, I really enjoyed that one. And then H.P. Lovecraft wrote a story called The Haunter of the Dark, dedicated to Robert Block, which is also, in a way, kind of a sequel to Robert Block's story. And this is also a fantastic story. Uh, one of my favorite Lovecraft stories, not like top five, but probably like top ten maybe. It's a really good one. And then after Lovecraft passed away uh, several years later, Robert Block wrote another story. Uh, this one, like the follow-up to Lovecraft's story, also dedicated to him. And this one was called The Shadow from the Steeple. And this story was also very, very good. Um, none of them quite perfect for me. I gave all three of those stories, I think, like a four out of five stars. Uh, there was no story in here that I absolutely loved that I gave like a five out of five stars to, I don't think. Um, but yeah, those three stories, that like little mini tr short story trilogy, I guess you could call it, those were my favorites from this book. And there were quite a few others, too, that I quite enjoyed. Um, let me kind of look at the contents here so I can remember. Uh, the Hounds of Tindalos. I'm saying that correctly, by Frank Belknap Long. I enjoyed that one. Um, Notebook Found in a Deserted House, another story by Robert Block. Uh, that was a pretty good one as well. The Salem Horror by Henry Kuttner. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, that one was about this guy that uh, is a writer and wants to get away, get some peace and quiet. So he takes up living in this like kind of run-down apartment building, I think it is. And he discovers this room. Uh, there's something like evil about this room. I think there's like markings and stuff on the wall and on the floor. And he really gets like peace and quiet in this room. It like shuts out noise from the outside world. But he encounters someone that tells him that he should not be in this room because there was a former, I think, witch that inhabited this room or something along those lines. I remember or forgetting the exact details, but this story was very creepy. And th things escalate in that story and get pretty crazy as well towards the climax. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, it's basically like an occult witchcraft type story. And that one ended up being really good. And then, let's see. There was one more that I really liked in here. Actually, a couple more. Rising with Cersei by Brian Lumley. That was a really good story as well. I've never read anything by Brian Lumley. He's a pretty big horror author. I think he's most well known for writing the Necroscope series in like the 80s, I believe, which I've never read, but I've heard great things about. Uh, that was one of my favorites in here. And then the last story I want to mention that is also like one of my top favorites, uh, contending for top favorite of this book, actually, is Styx by Carl Edward Wagner. I believe Carl Edward Wagner was also a fairly well-known horror author back in the day. Again, I had never read anything uh, from him prior to his short story in this book. And I really enjoyed that one. Sticks was a great story. Uh, there were a lot of other decent ones and a few bad ones as well. <laughs> Towards the back half of this book, we start getting into some kind of iffy territory. Some of the late latter stories in here were not good at all. Uh, I'll be honest, there were a couple that I even kind of skimmed through because they were so bad. Um, the ones that I just did not enjoy at all are, let me see, one of them is called My Boat by Joanna Russ, uh, and this story isn't necessarily just like terrible or anything, but it feels so out of place in this collection. It's not a horror story whatsoever. It's not even a Cthulhu mythos story. Uh, it's like a really short like fantasy story, and I think the only connection it has to like Cthulhu mythos, if you could even say that, is that I think it briefly like name drops one of Lovecraft's stories, if I remember correctly. Like it's not even a Cthulhu Mythos story. It's not horror. It just feels so out of place in this collection. It's like a really short five page like fantasy story. And it wasn't horrible, but I just, it left me scratching my head. I'm like, what was that? Why is it in this book? <laughs> Did not really care for that one. And then the two that I really despised. Um, again, I'm not remembering the names to any of these, so I keep having to look at the contents here. Uh, let me see. The two stories in here I really despised. Uh, the first one being The Freshman by Philip Jose Farmer. I did not like that one. And then the worst story in this entire book is the very last story in this collection. It's called The Discovery of the Gurik Zone. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Gorik, Gorik, it's some weird name. I don't know. By Richard Lupoff. This story was awful. 
This is another one that kind of left me scratching my head. I don't know why it's even in this book. Uh, I believe this is also the most recent story to come out that's published in this collection. I think that one was written in like the 70s or the 80s. Uh, I mean, which is still pretty old, but compared to the rest of the stories in here, which were written in like the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And this one is basically about these cyborgs that live on some planet in the distant future. And they are looking for a new planet to inhabit. And they are just flying around space in their spaceship. And this, this short story opens up with these cyborgs doing it. Doing the dirty deed. <laughs> I have no idea why. It's not like overly explicit or anything. It doesn't go into great detail. But the literally the opening sentence of this short story uh, tells you that these three cyborgs are getting it on. I don't know why. It, it just feels so random. And yeah, they're basically just flying around space looking for a new planet to inhabit. And they finally discover a new planet that they're going to go visit. They go there. And then like the final punchline like twist of this story is that the planet that they travel to and decide to live on happens to be inhabited by like the great old ones, like the elder gods, uh, like the characters that Lovecraft has created, like the Cthulhu mythos, uh, what they're about. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> there was some other stuff going on with that story. It's not quite as simple as I made it out to be, I'll admit, but I kind of skimmed over this one a little bit because I just did not care about it at all. I don't remember all the fine details, nor do I care to. This story was just awful to me. I don't know why it was in this book. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. The editor of this book, I believe his name is Jim Turner. Let me see. James Turner. And yeah, that story was awful. I gave it a flat one out of five stars. So yeah, overall, I enjoyed this book for the most part. I started it at the beginning of the month, which is why I decided to talk about this one first. And I kind of read it gradually throughout the month. And for the most part, it was good, but those last few stories were just, they were terrible. So yeah, that's Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. Okay, um, I actually forget what order I read these in, so I don't know if I'm grabbing them in the exact order I read them in, but whatever. <laughs> the next book that I read in March is Goblin Monday, part of the House of Shiver series, the second book. And I did an individual review for this one, so I won't be going into a lot of detail about it here. But in short, I was a little bit disappointed with it. I was not really a big fan of this book. I gave it a flat two out of five stars, I believe. And yeah, it wasn't horrible. It could have been a lot worse, but it also could have been a lot better. It just wasn't something I was real happy with. This one just feels like it just is more rehashing of old ideas of other Goosebump stories we've seen before with just a couple of twist endings that I did not like and I did not care for. And there's just a lot of like logical inconsistencies inconsistencies in here which I think is one of the things that bother me about it as well you know there's a big twist like three quarters of the way through I think that just doesn't make sense prior to all of the stuff that happens uh, before that and yeah I just wasn't a big fan of this one Goblin Monday gets a two out of five stars uh, hopefully the next House of Sugar's book will be a little bit better okay the next book that I read this month uh, is Stay Away from the Treehouse. Uh, this is part of the Ghost of Fear Street series. This is book number five in the series. And I kind of just picked this one up on impulse. Uh, I like reading through these occasionally and at some point down the road. Of course, I'll be doing a ranking of all of these. And I've read quite a few of them so far. I think I'm like nearing the halfway mark of the Ghost of Fear Street books. And of course, I'm just kind of reading them out of order. Just whichever ones I'm in the mood to read. And this one was just kind of okay. I actually forget what I rated this one. Um, I did not bring my notebook with me where I like log everything that I read and have my ratings. I forgot to grab it. Uh, but I think I gave this one like a two and a half out of five stars maybe. It starts out pretty good. Uh, I like the setup and the concept to this one. I've never seen or heard of like a haunted treehouse type story before. I kind of like the idea for this one. Unfortunately... As the story progresses and we get towards like the climax and like the final act of the story, it turns into like kind of a cozy like Hallmark type story. There are actual ghosts in this story that are haunting this treehouse, but it goes down the route where these ghosts are like benevolent, I guess you could say. They're not really evil or there's no stakes in this book or real danger. There's a few things that happen earlier on that are kind of creepy. 
and it gives you the idea that these ghosts are dangerous and out to harm the main characters. Uh, but as the story progresses, we learn that they're really not. These ghosts are really just like trying to cross over to the other side and they become sort of friends with the main characters and the main characters, yeah, basically try to help them like cross over and like to be at peace or whatever. And it's just really corny and a bit too childish for my tastes and yeah, it feels like a Hallmark story or something. I don't know. <laughs> it. I did not like the second half of this book. The first half was pretty good. Towards the second half, I just started losing interest a little bit. But it wasn't horrible. Like a 2.25 2 or 2.5 out of 5, around there. Um, yeah, that was Stay Away from the Treehouse. Okay, the next book that I read this month is The Bronze Bow by Elizabeth George Spear. So I've read two books by Elizabeth George Spear. Uh, Spear so far, and both of them I have enjoyed. One immensely, one of them being one of my all-time favorite books with The Witch of Blackbird Pond, and then the other one, The Sign of the Beaver, which I did not enjoy that one quite as much, but I still thought was very good, and I gave a four out of five stars. Um, in hindsight, I'll probably bump that one down a little bit to like a 3.75 out of five, because I enjoyed this book quite a bit. Um, I enjoyed it a little bit more than that one, and I decided to give this a four out of five stars. So, for those of you who might not be aware of this author or her work, um, Elizabeth George Spear, she only wrote four books, but all of them were at least nominated for a Newbery Honor Award. And this one, did it win it? I think it did. Yeah, it says John Newbery Medal on the front here. So I think two of her books won the award, and then the other two were just nominees. And I could see why. Um, Elizabeth George Spear is a writer of historical fiction, so the four books that she wrote are fiction books that are based on true events in history or have like true settings. Usually the characters themselves are fictional, but the events and like time settings and things like that are usually pretty accurate um, to history. In this case, I guess it's accurate depending on whether or not you believe the Bible is historically accurate. The Bronze Bow is all about the story of David as a young boy living in uh, Israel during the time where it's being ruled and governed by the Roman Empire, he grows up, he lives with a band of rebels, he doesn't have much family. I believe he has a grandmother and then a sister that live far away in a village. And he's basically living in the mountains with this band of rebels, whose goal is pretty much to like destroy and fight back against the Roman Empire that have sort of taken, o taken over. And... I really enjoyed this book. I thought this was great. I, yeah, I don't really have anything like negative to say about this book. I just didn't quite love it, which is why I gave it a four out of five. Uh, it does start out, I guess, a little bit slow. It just kind of is sh showcasing David's life, you know, very poor, just living off of scraps, him with his band of rebels, stealing from farmers, attacking Roman soldiers and getting equipment from them. But I was trying to do a little bit of just casual research, trying to figure out like how much of this book um, is fact versus fiction. And I couldn't really find anything too concrete. Uh, but I gathered that the characters in here, um, for the most part, uh, most of the characters in this book, not all of them, were real people in the Bible. Um, again, this all just depends on your view of whether or not you believe the Bible is true, if it's historically accurate. Um, and then, of course, the setting... And then with the rule of the Roman Empire, that all actually happened. Um, but the rest of this book, I believe, is just kind of fiction. Um, David, we don't really know about lot about his life as a child from the Bible, at least from what little bit I've read into it. Um, so yeah, a lot of that is just kind of uh, made up. But I still really enjoyed this book. It's a very powerful book, very emotional story. And... Even though this is geared more towards the younger audience, I don't know if that this is considered like children's or young adults. All of her work, I think, is is towards like the middle grade um, or in between like middle grade and young adult audience. Um, but even though it's geared towards that audience, you know, there's some pretty heavy thematic content in this book. Very mature stuff. There's deaths in this book. There's a bit of violence and stuff in here. It's very realistic. It's Elizabeth George Spear is not afraid to shy away from like the darker uh, aspects of life, I guess you could say. Um, she doesn't really shy away from the violence and, you know, just the more realistic 
portrayals of like grief and things of that nature. So yeah, this is a book that just really captivated me. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, I don't know. If this sounds like something you're into, I would maybe check this out. The only reason that I wanted this book and wanted to read it is because it was by Elizabeth George Spear. And everything I've read by this author and still up to this point, I've really, really enjoyed. And she has one book left that I need to read that I believe is called The Calico Captive. I do not have that book yet, but I will be reading it at some point to round out uh, my reading of all of her books. And even though she only wrote four books, um, and I assume the last one will be as well, um, just absolutely fantastic. This is a very talented author. I'm surprised she did not write more. I love her writing style. I'm not sure what it is, but there's just something about her writing style that flows so well. She just seems like a very talented author. Um, yeah, I'm just puzzled why she didn't write more because I feel like she would have been a huge success. I mean, as it is, two out of the four books she published won the Newbery Honor Award. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's The Bronze Bow. Four out of five stars for that one. This was a pretty great book. Okay. Uh, the next book that I read this month is book number six in the Martian Tale series by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This one is called The Mastermind of Mars. And with this book, we start to kind of get out into like the spin-off territory of the Martian Tales books. This one does not feature any of the main characters of the Martian Tale series. You do not have John Carter in here. Well, for the most part. He makes like a small cameo towards the end of the book. Uh, but you do not have John Carter or any of his like companions in this book. Or his two children, which were like char main characters of the previous books in this series. This one is kind of like a spinoff. Instead, we follow the character of, let me see, his name is on the back here, U Ulysses Paxton. Um, and it opens up with Ulysses Paxton in the war. I believe uh, World War, I forget what this book was published. 1927, so it probably would have been World War I. And he's basically on his deathbed in this war. There's like a bomb or something that explodes around him and kills a bunch of his comrades in, in this battle. And kind of like John Carter in the first Mars book, he is somehow magically transported to the planet of Barsoom. And John, or not John, <laughs> Ulysses Paxton's story is quite a bit different from John Carter's. He There is the typical like love at first sight in this book. He falls in love with some Martian girl that he sets out to rescue. Um, but the setting for this story is quite a bit different. This one is not really as action-packed and violent as the previous Martian Tales books. Uh, basically, Ulysses Paxton is enlisted um, as the aide of like this really smart Martian that is basically like a Victor Frankenstein type character who performs these different operations where he transfers different organs and brains to various bodies. And it's like this just really freaky, like, mad scientist stuff going on. And this guy, this mad scientist type Martian, I already forget his name. He's not really portrayed as this, like, villainous character at first, nor is he really, like, benevolent either. He's just kind of this neutral character who happens to be, like, one of the smartest guys on the planet of Arsum. One of the smartest Martians, I guess. And he basically undergoes this practice of doing all of these operations to um, save lives, but at the same time, a lot of these different operations and like brain switch, body swapping he does, um, some of them are for bad also. It, it, there's, it, there's like some nefarious things going on, I guess, with some of these different medical pro procedures that he does. I don't know. <laughs> and for a while, um, our main character, Ulysses, he basically kind of goes along with working for this guy. Um, you know, he's magically transported to this planet. He doesn't really have anywhere else to go or anything else to do. And the mad scientist trusts Ulysses because he doesn't really trust any of the other aliens because I can't remember the whole explanation to it. The, this mad scientist guy is able to like read the minds of all of the other aliens that are in his vicinity and that work for him. Um, his like slaves essentially. And he doesn't trust any of them. They all hate him because this guy, they think of him like as being evil, doing all of these crazy experiments and things like that. Um, and he's not able to read the mind of Ulysses. So he basically takes a gamble and trusts our main character. And our main character doesn't really like this mad scientist guy either. Um, but he falls in love with one of the experiments, uh, a young female Martian that is, of course, described as being beautiful and gorgeous. 
and he just falls in love with her at first sight and she has become the object of one of his experiments and the mad scientist decides to like body swap her with this other martian um for some reason again i'm forgetting the fine details here <laughs> so yeah and then he sets out on a mission to like correct this and to like kidnap this martian that uh this she was swapped bodies with to get her back in her own body and yeah that's <laughs> That's pretty much the plot of this one. I'll be honest, I was not a huge fan of this book. This is probably one of the least favorite, one of my least favorites I've read so far in The Martian Tales. It wasn't terrible. I didn't hate it. I still enjoyed it a little bit. Um, it was kind of fun with all the crazy mad scientist stuff going on in here. It wasn't really as action-packed as the other Martian Tales books. This one was a little bit slower paced. It was okay, I guess. I give it like a 2.25 out of 5. And... Yeah, it was all right. The Mastermind of Mars, book number six in the Martian Tale series. It was all right. Okay, and then the last book that I read this month is The Haunt of Fear, volume two. Uh, classic EC horror comics. This is a bind up of issues, what is it? Issues seven through 12 of the Haunt of Fear comics. And it shows you those on the back cover there. And I was kind of gradually reading through this throughout the month as well, along with the Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. And I enjoyed this. This was pretty decent for the most part. I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars, uh, like most of these classic EC horror comics. And anthology stories and comics in general, you know, you have a lot of good stories in here. And then a lot that are not so great. Uh, my favorite stories in here were... Let me find the contents and I will tell you. Let's see. Um... The Acid Test, I really enjoyed that one. That one was written by Al Feldstein. Um, let's see. Ooze in the Cellar, also by Al Feldstein. I really enjoyed that one as well. And there was one more I really liked in here, Forbidden Fruit. That one was a good one. Actually, most of these are written by Al Feldstein, it looks like. So yeah, there were a few pretty good stories in here. And then there were also a few stories in here that were adapted into Tales from the Crypt episodes, which... I've actually been watching through recently. I have seen most of the show now. I'm on the final season, season seven. I've got a few more episodes to go. Unfortunately, this show kind of falls apart towards the end. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of going off on a tangent there. Um, <laughs> but the episodes that were adapted from this volume into the TV show were On a Dead Man's Chest, uh, What's Cooking, Till Death Do We Part, here today, gone tomorrow, and I think that might be it. I think it might just be those four. I believe it was just those four that were adapted. And the stories, sometimes the stories are better than the episode adaptations, not always. And in this case, none of them were. <laughs> All four stories in here that I've read um, that were adapted into the episodes were not as good as the episodes, in my opinion. Um, they're very different, too. Like completely different uh there's like just the basic concept is really all that remains or that's all that's like similar between them and yeah it was okay i don't know i don't really have a lot to say about this i guess if you've read these old ec horror comics you know what they're about they're very just short a lot of them do get kind of like repetitive and formulaic you have a lot of like stereotypical stories in here where there's like an affair going on you have like gold digger stories and somebody like getting revenge on um, a character you have characters rising back from the dead to bring vengeance upon the person that killed them a lot of comeuppance type stories um, these tend to tend to be a little bit like formulaic but I enjoy reading through these occasionally I really enjoy the Tales from the Crypt TV show and yeah this is volume two of The Haunt of Fear I also have volumes two of The Vault of Horror and Tales from the Crypt as well. Um, at some point, I'll get to those. And eventually, I'd like to buy the rest of these volumes so I could have the complete collection. But it's not like a huge priority for me. Occasionally, I'll just buy them online. Um, but yeah, that was The Haunt of Fear Volume 2. Overall, it was decent. I gave it like a 3 out of 5 stars. Um, so yeah, that was the last thing I read this month. Okay, so I have no idea how I forgot to talk about this. But this was actually the first book that I read this month in March. I, yeah, I don't know how I forgot about this book. <laughs> but yeah, I read this in March. 
uh, in March also, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. And I'll just talk about it very briefly here since this video ended up already being kind of long. And I don't feel like setting up my camera again and everything because I'm lazy. <laughs> but I absolutely love this book. The Half-Blood Prince is honestly probably my favorite Harry Potter book that I've read so far. This book was awesome. And thankfully, this book was not nearly as padded as the last one, The Order of the Phoenix. Order of the Phoenix. It's still quite sizable. I think it's around 600 pages. But there's not a dull moment in this book. It's much, much faster paced. And even though, even when it does get a bit slower during the middle and we focus more on character development and just following their more like mundane aspects of life, I guess, and just the shenanigans that go on at Hogwarts, it's still all very entertaining. You know, you get a, your typical like bickering and joking around with the characters. There's some romance stuff in here. And it's... It's still entertaining all the way through. This one, there was not a dull moment in it. I read this book in like two and a half days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, six 600 pages in like two and a half days, but it is it is very fast paced, like I said too, and very easily readable. So it it felt easy, easy to fly through very quickly, even though it's a little bit longer still. It didn't feel that long. Uh, it wasn't like Order of the Phoenix, where it felt like it was a little bit of a slog to get through at times. And this book opens up, and ends with just some of the darkest and most intense stuff that has probably been in these books so far. Like, it is just insane, some of the stuff that goes on in this book. Um, in the opening, and then, of course, at the climax of the story. And, yeah, I love The Half-Blood Prince. I'm giving this book probably a 5 out of 5 stars, honestly. I think this is my favorite Harry Potter book that I've read so far. So, yeah. So yeah, I did not really have a ton that I read this month. That's like half of what I normally read. Uh, but it's fine. I've just been watching TV shows and doing other stuff instead. Sometimes I have to slow down a little bit when I start to get kind of burned out. But hopefully coming up here soon, maybe this month in April, I'll get back into the swing of things and start reading a bit more because there's a lot of books I really want to get to. So yeah, those are the six books that I read this month. If you've read them, if you have any thoughts you want to share, of course, as always, feel free to post down in the comments below, and thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.